regional manager for Reef Check California, and she's based in Fort Bragg, just up the road. She, yeah, she received her uh, Bachelor of Science degree in Marine Biology and Legal Studies from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and she has led a number of projects spanning the Pacific Northwest, all of which focused on kelp forest ecosystems, um, the dynamic of that, and long-term monitoring, and Tristan, I'm so glad you were available today uh, to come down a few miles up north from Fort Bragg and be our next presenter. So welcome, Tristan. Thanks so much. Bum, bum, bum. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Cool. Um, so everyone in the back good? Can you hear me? Great. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tristan. I'm really excited to be here. I live here locally in Fort Bragg, um, as it was mentioned. And I think more specifically, I'm stoked that there is an Ocean Life Symposium happening around here. And I was really excited to hear about it and even more excited to come speak with you today. Um, and I think what I'm really going to focus on, I, I could go in any number of directions, but I have something planned. Um, if I don't get to something that you have an itching question for, and I was supposed to be a panelist, um, please ask at the end, jot it down, especially you students in the back. If you have questions about anything, please just write it down, and we'll, I'll hopefully end a little early so we can answer those questions. Um, the title of my talk is Beneath the Waves, an overview of the nearshore subtidal environment. And before I dive in, my name is again Tristan, and my job as the regional manager is to train recreational scuba divers to become scientific divers. Um, we do this by training them in specific monitoring protocols as well as species identification here in our local waters, as well as throughout the state and actually in 40 different countries all over the world. So we have this conglomerate network of reef monitoring efforts and we house it in data and all of this data is um, available to you, to managers, to scientists all over the world and it's open access. So I suggest you go look at that if you have the chance or have interest. Um, sorry, let me just adjust that. Perfect. Um, so after, so may, maybe you're asking like, so what happens with the data in addition to this? I come out and I do these sorts of presentations. Again, we, we take divers underwater and it's really important that we relay what we're seeing because not everyone can get underwater all the time. And so in addition to these public events, I also go to a number of different scientific conferences as well as provide our data to the state as the North Coast is a data dead zone for, for the most part. Um, it's very hard to conduct surveys in this area, do research because of a number of different environmental factors. So um, I, I think that's the other kind of flip side to, to the job as well. Um, but today I'm really excited to talk to you about um, what our divers have been seeing here over the past few years and um, just share that information with you. So. Planet Earth, more like planet ocean, right? 71% um, of the globe's surface is covered in water and covered in the ocean. Um, in fact, over 90% of habitable space here on Earth is actually just beneath the waves in a place called the subtidal. Um, a little ocean orientation. Um, all the oceans, as it was stated, are connected as one continuous body of water. However, water is able to move around the world um, via ocean currents, and ocean currents actually act much like a conveyor belt. Um, they transport warm water and precipitation um, from the equator towards the poles and recirculate that water back towards the poles. So it creates this kind of um, circulation effort, and it, it also helps regulate the global, global climate, right? So this counters the uneven distribution to which solar radiation hits the Earth. So it, the currents actually play a really big role in how our, our globe um, how our globe actually distributes water and heat, for that matter. And I think it's also important to note that ocean water moves in two directions, horizontally and vertically. Um, horizontal movements are the currents, right? They're somewhat predictable, directional, and they move seawater. Um, but this movement is largely driven by gravity, wind via the Coriolis effect, right, the spin of the Earth, um, and it's also driven by water density. 
And these currents circulate this water all around the globe. Vertical movement, oh sorry, the last thing two are these currents, they circulate in about a thousand year cycle as well. Um, vertical movements, however, are kind of that top down movement of water. Um, and what are, what are the two versions that we get here on our coast? Upwelling and downwelling, those are, those are vertical, uh, vertical movements of water. Upwelling is the process to which uh, warm water gets sloughed off by wind and cold nutrient water comes up from the deep, filling in those areas, bringing that productivity into our coastal areas. Alternatively, you have downwelling, which is quite the opposite, where you actually have a buildup of water um, kind of coming, coming towards the cliffs here, for example, building up and then shooting down and actually downwelling, pushing that water into deeper waters or deeper um, areas. And so um, the process of both vertical and horizontal movement, again, play a large role not only for a global climate um, temperature regulation, but also in moving critters all over the sea. Specifically, um, currents carry nutrients and food to organisms that can live permanently attached in one place. So you have your sessile inverts that need you know, those currents to bring them all the goodies. Um, and so that's, that's a really big um, reason why we need currents. The other is that they actually physically carry um, ocean life out into areas that it normally wouldn't go. So a pelagic life cycle, for example. Um, so I guess specifically, my, my background is algae. I, I freaking love algae. But um, <laughs> red algae, even better. Um, do you know how many species of red algae there are in the world? <laughs> Can I tell you? 6,000. Right? That's crazy. 6,000 species of red algae in marine and freshwater systems. Um, how many are in California? 500. Yeah. So ju just like at face value, just think about what that means at, for the role of currents to distribute these organisms throughout, throughout the world. And that's kind of the, I think red algae is the case in point, right? You have something that is so diverse in morphology and it's primarily due to the fact that Red algae can also do this thing where after they detach, let's say a big storm comes and it's all ripped up. If it's still floating in the ocean and it's reproductive, it can drop spores that whole time. Drop, 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 drop. There was a study that found um, a reproductive individual from Germany making it all the way down to South Africa. So just think about the potential of what currents are able to do for, for those sorts of living organisms. Um, and I, trust me, I could go on about this forever, but let's, let's move on. Um, I'd like to really focus on this magical place called the subtitle, the nearshore subtitle. So what exactly is the nearshore subtitle? Um, let's, let's break those words down. Nearshore um, is actually described by the US Geological Survey as an area from land to 30 meters in depth, which is about 98 feet. Um, and the subtitle can be described as um, areas that are covered by water at all times of the tide, right? So in its low, low, low tide, if it's still covered in water, that's considered the subtitle. Um, and the nearshore subtitle environment itself is widely variable in species composition, mostly due to where it is on the planet. Um, just like I described with the differences in oceanographic processes, such as currents, temperature, nutrients, and light availability in these places. Um, but can you think of maybe one or two nearshore subtitle environments that we have here on Earth? Kelp forests. Kelp forests. Other ones? Ooh, we're going to get to that. Ooh, terminology. Here we go. So the nearshore subtitle zone is a variety of ecosystems, right? Think how we broke those words down. Nearshore subtitle. That can be a coral reef. Right, it's close to shore, and it's in that it's in that depth gradient. You can also have seagrass meadows that you find in bays and estuaries. You can also have sand environments that have um, you know your clams and your worms and those sorts of goodies. And then you have your temperate rocky reef, right? Um, and which one of these do we have here? If I went off the bluff here and did a cannonball, what would I hit? Yeah, I'd hit that temperate rocky reef. Exactly. So why did I call it temperate rocky reef and not kelp forest? Any thoughts? <laughs> well, there's no kelp left. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> well, sort of. But I guess it's, 
again, this is the thing with terminology, right? We think, we think about the ocean as this ubiquitous, just big old thing that we don't necessarily understand, but there are these little micro environments, these little places. And we've been focusing on whales and those, those big creatures that migrate these large expanses, but I'm, I'm focusing on this very narrow margin of the coastline here. And these are temperate rocky reefs. So again, breaking it down, temperate is cooler water, right? So we have temperate waters here. Um, just like you would get a temperate, temperate rainforest, right? Um, and a rocky reef, right, the other term, um, is a, a reef made of rock as opposed to coral, right? So that's, that's what I mean by temperate rocky reef. And that's what I mean by putting this figure down here is this is what we have down here. Um, but what's interesting is that a temperate rocky reef, so again, this rock that is dominated by three-dimensional habitat-forming algae is called... Anyone? Yeah, it's called a kelp forest. Yeah. So when you have that three-dimensional algae structure on the temperate rocky reef itself, that is the state of a kelp forest. As opposed to that, you can have another state, another phase state, which can be an urchin barren, right? So a temperate rocky reef itself, um, I think it's super important to keep in mind that um, they're known to exist in these multiple states and that no single state itself is fixed. So a kelp forest state is not fixed as we've seen it transition into something else. The temperate reef is the home and then the things that grow on it are what constitute it to be a kelp forest or an urchin barren. Um, but for now, what I, I want to do is focus on um, the, the kelp forest system and talk a little bit about the kelp forest state. So in temperate rocky reefs worldwide, again, you can find kelp forests. They're incredibly beautiful, aesthetically appealing, and culturally valued. Um, but remember how we talked about those global differences. Um, again, case in point, all of these, although considered kelp forests, have a different composition of species, although they can still fill that uh, similar functional role, for example. Um, but I'm, I'm here today to talk not about these places necessarily, but about what we have here in the North Coast. So in our ocean backyard, um, we have two different types of canopy forming kelps. One, which is the giant kelp on the left side, and then the other, which is bull kelp on the right side. These two organisms, these two canopy forming species, um, greatly differ in their reproductive strategy as well as morphology, which generally allows one species to do better than the other. Um, for example, bull kelp is an annual species and giant kelp is a perennial species. Very different life history strategies. Each one can capitalize on a number of different environments. But which one of these two do we primarily have here? Bull kelp, why do you think that is? Why, why would an annual species do necessarily better here? Does, what was that? Upwelling? Turbulence? Yeah, all, all great answers. There, there, what was that? Sunlight? It, it could certainly be sunlight. Um, I think that's, that's a really cool thing to explore mentally. Just kind of thinking about some of the reasons why one species does better than the other is a really good place to start. But um, just at face value, look at, the, look at the body shape of a bull kelp, right? It's kind of this sleek, narrow sort of situation. A lot of waves can come by it, and it just it does its thing. It's all slender. It just kind of lets the wind go by it, and it does just fine. As opposed to giant kelp, where you have a bunch of these stipes, right? The stipes are like the tree trunks going up to the surface. And what happens is those can tangle on each other and get ripped out really easily. So again, like what we have here in the North Coast is not fixed by any means. We may be used to bull kelp, but potentially in the future we could get giant kelp, right? It's, it's just a matter of what environment allows these individuals to grow in these places. Um, but I think what's kind of cool about both these species is that um, fish use this environment as a place to have a nursery habitat. And so the rockfish, the lingcod, the cabazon, um, the things that we value, the things we go fishing for, um, actually spend a good portion of their lives in the kelp canopy, um, where they eat on little amphipods, like little crustaceans, and then they also eat each other, which is great. Um, and then when the fish are nice, big, and strong, they actually descend down the stipe, right, that tree trunk, and then they begin life as a bottom dweller. Yeah, this, I took this this year. 
So, the relationship between algae and ocean critters is much like the relationship between the trees and the ferns in a forest. It's all connected. So think, algae, so at the very bottom, algae is food for these small invertebrates. And what eats those invertebrates? The fish, yeah, in, in Southern California lobsters. And then what eats those? The mammals. What eats those? The sharks. And then who's on top? We are, yeah. Yeah, we always are. Um, and this isn't a surprise or new news, right? Our ancestors um, mastered deep sea fishing over 40,000 years ago. And in addition to our historical protein extraction that we have been doing, um, we have a more pervasive threat that's now impacting our nearshore subtidal environment. Um, and that is, in fact, climate change. So um, please raise your hand if you've seen one of my talks before at the Noyo Center here. Okay, so you may see um, a few redundant slides here moving forward. Um, but again, heat is fuel for storms. Um, heat is being trapped in our atmosphere, right? What happens when you grab a thermos of coffee and you shake it? What happens to the lid? Why is that? Water vapor, pressure. Um, water vapor is heat, it's fuel, fuel for storms. And that same sort of idea can be applied in, to a certain extent to the ocean. Um, and so what we're expecting to see in the future are more frequent, strong, and intense storm action hitting our coastal nearshore environment. And this makes it really difficult for a species such as bull kelp, right? If it's an annual species and that puppy gets ripped out before it has a chance to reproduce, what happens? It doesn't reproduce. Um, in terms of other changes, um, in 2014 to 2015, we had this pool of abnormally warm water come and stay on our coastline. Um, and this, this can also further change water chemistry. So a lot of algae use temperature cues to say, hey, time for you to reproduce. Hey, time for you to send your spores off. There, there are all these temperature cues that tell, um, especially algae, what to do when. And this applies to a bunch of small marine critters as well. Um, the, uh, in conjunction with the warm blob, a year after, um, you know, between winter 2015, 2016, we started experiencing one of the most intense El Nino periods our coast had ever seen before. Um, and this, this also changed water temperatures as well as nutrient availability. And actually at about 17 degrees Celsius um, for giant kelp in Southern California, nutrients become unavailable for it to actually extract from the water itself. So even though nutrients could be there, they're functionally not there and available for algae to use. So you know, it, it may be out of sight, but it's certainly not out of mind for some of the processes that we're thinking about here. Um, but in conjunction to an, a changing ocean environment in terms of warmth, we also have changes in our biology. So um, the first of many human-induced changes happened in kelp forests in the Eastern Pacific in the early 1700s when trappers began, um, began the fur trade and working their way from Alaska all the way down to Baja, um, just totally taking out the otter population. And um, I think it was by, what was it? Yeah, by 1840, um, so a matter of like 40 years, the otter had become ecologically extinct or functionally extinct from this region. And it wasn't until, I believe, 1930, yeah, 1940, that a small population of otters was found in the Big Sur coast. So a lot of the, I mean, most all of the otters that you see now in Monterey Bay are a member of that family. So I think that's also a very important thing to consider is that um, federal protection efforts, while they were received in 1911 with the uh, North Pacific Fur Seal Treaty, um, so that happened in 1911, 1972, the Marine Mammal Protection Act came through, and that's part of the reason why that, that population was able to sustain as well as expand. But where is that otter population now? Yeah, it's pretty much truncated from about, like there, there's a small pocket of otters in um, as far north as Bodega Bay, but I've, I've talked to a few folks and what happens is, although they come up to like the Fort Ross area, they actually swim back into Bodega Bay and those are actually the males who are looking for new habitat because males are, um, they create their own harems and geographic locations. So they haven't expanded north and they also haven't expanded south past Point Conception, which is just north of Santa Barbara. So um, 
Although authors are still around, um, just know that their range, the areas to which they occupy, have greatly shrunk. And with the authors gone, the only remaining predator of any sort here in North Coast waters was actually the, the sunflower star Pycnopodia helianthoides, as well as the ochre star um, Pisastro cratius, were, were the two species that um, were heavily, heavily impacted by the sea star wasting syndrome, which um, is a Denza virus that impacted, I believe it was over 92% of sea star species, just went toast in a matter of a year. Um, and I, I actually had the opportunity to dive during this time, and we, we cataloged all of this happening in California, Oregon, and Washington. And it was pretty crazy to see the synchronous timing of all of it. So we saw it happening in California first, um, first because we have a lot of divers in the water. And then by the time we got up to Washington, we caught it like right as they were turning. So although this is, um, you know, we haven't seen many of these sunflower stars um, at all in California waters. Um, just last week, really, really good news, just last week we saw a few um, sunflower stars starting to really show up in areas in British Columbia, like Malcolm Island area, as well as um, Southeast Alaska, Sitka area. Um, but again, here in the North Coast, functionally not present, no, neither of those two species. No, so um, there have been reports of like a deeper like sunflower star, but that's actually the cousin of the sunflower star, uh, Rath Rathabuster or something. Um, so not the same individual, but um, the only reason we know that is because folks have been sending us photos of them. Yeah. Um, so in addition to all of that, when I'm talking about all these things happening in the North Coast, um, the last thing was this widespread recruitment of urchins. And it's not to be said that the sea star in itself was the one that was keeping that population in check, because previous to that, we, we don't really have a strong impetus to say that the, the sea stars were directly um, controlling those populations. But instead, perhaps we got this widespread recruitment of urchins that came from deeper waters, or places that, they, um, that we didn't see them beforehand. And part of the reason we know that is because the, um, the purple urchins that were showing up in our kelp forest were actually the size of adults. So they were at least three years old by the time they got into um, the nearshore subtidal environment. So I think that's a very important thing to think about too, is um, it wasn't all of a sudden, you know, sunflower star gone, they just started reproducing and that's what we got. It was instead that they had this behavioral change, something triggered and said, all right, move in shallow, start taking over that near shore environment. And what's crazy is that this sort of thing happened in pulses all over the state of California. Some of which stayed, like here in the North Coast, others like in Central Coast, like Monterey area, those urchins, um, came through and they receded, right, in some places. Why? We're not sure yet. To be determined. Um, so, it, partially otters, and I, I can answer to that after the talk too. Um, so, in addition to this, the news has been covering this whole story about this phase shift, and you just hear these things like ab abalone fishery shut down, bull kelp disappearing, and I'd just like to show you a few graphs just to. Um, drive that point home. And so again, we saw this phase shift happening in the North Coast, a transition from kelp to a transitionary state where urchins were mowing down everything that grew. And then what we were most often left with are these areas completely blanketed by purple urchins with some red urchins mixed in there. And so this is, um, again, this is all data that was collected by our volunteer scuba divers, which is Awesome. Yes, they're incredible people. Um, I don't know why that 0.05 is there, but don't look at that. Um, so basically, <laughs> x-axis, we have time. So 2007 into 2018. I haven't processed the series data just yet. Um, sunflower star is on your left side. And know that um, the way that we show our data is by number of individuals per 60 meter square area. So what that means is a transect. So 30 meters by one meter by one meter. And that's how our divers do our survey. So in that total area, um, those are the number of individuals that you would expect to see. So left side sunflower star, notice the scale, zero to three. And then on the right side, you have purple urchin, zero to 1,200. So again, notice the scale. 
Um, so again, what we, what we saw here was this complete drop in sunflower stars between 2013 to 2014, and we haven't seen any sunflower stars on transect ever since, since that drop off. Alternatively, we saw a butt ton of purple urchins, because between 2013 and 2014, we see this slight increased start, right? It's just, they're just starting to work through the system. And then 2014, 2015, look what happened, right? You go from seeing about, you know, 175 individuals per transect to over 400. That's a lot of change, right? So big changes, and it continued to increase with a slight decrease last year. But again, look at the error bars, right? So that shows the variation from site to site. Um, and just know that these are also, the data I'm showing you is for the North Coast, which is Sonoma and Mendocino County. So I truncated all that data for just these two regions. Um, the next graph I want to show, purple urchins are the same. But on the left side, um, we have bull kelp and terragophora. Um, bull kelp here, that individual that went up to the surface, and then terragophora is like your fern of, of the ocean. Um, and so again, same, same sort of situation happened 2013 about to 2014, you know, kind of oscillating, kind of variable, but then complete drop off. Um, between 2014 to 2015. And then by 2016, it was pain, pain, painfully low um, and continued to stay low as urchins continued to increase. And then for the abalone, um, purple urchins pretty much uh, just outcompeted the abalone at, at face value, right? They're just better grazers, they reproduce better, they move faster, um, they're not hemophiliacs like, um, like abalone are. It's just abalone had everything wrong working for it and purple urchins just outcompeted them. And so here again, I'm showing you bull kelp and then the abalone. Um, what do you think, I, I think probably the coolest part about this graph is what happened in 2014. So what do you think happened in 2014? Why, why that spike in abalone? What would cause that? Ooh, any divers in the room? No, do you have an idea? I'm just thinking that the, the, either the water change, temperature change or the deeper water um, food source decrease in the big blue shell Nailed it. Nailed it. That's, that's what happened. So what we saw here in 2014, so remember, look at the bull kelp. Look what's happening with the amount of food that's available. So, so look at the amount of food that's available here. So what, what would cause things to spike like that, right? They're looking for food. They're actively, they're behaviorally changing where they operate, right? So what happened was um, a lot of divers recognized that all of a sudden these, um, as the purple urchins were pushing their way closer, closer, closer to shore, um, the abalone were actually getting like pushed shallower and shallower and also coming out of their cracks and crevices, urchins were just like coming and closing in on them. So that, what we saw in 20, that spike is actually a behavioral change, but not in fact like a population, all of a sudden they did really well. It was just that they were moving into new environments and changing where the space that they occupy. Um, which the reason I focused on that is um, we went ahead and processed our fish data and we just put in our 2019 um, data point, which was really exciting um, because we didn't see it tank, which is what, you know, you really don't want to see as a biologist, right? You don't want to see, you know, I saw 2018 and I'm like, well, 2019 is going to be quite telling, right? And what we ended up seeing was that it actually validated what we saw in 2018, which is that perhaps the fish populations are in fact just stabilizing. That could be something that happens because some studies, especially in the Aleutian Archipelago, have found that fish will recruit to remember the temperate rocky reef. This is why I, I kind of spaced out those two phases. They will recruit to the temperate rocky reef whether or not, regardless of whether kelp is there. However, a really important thing to remember is, what was that video I showed you of? Little baby fish recruiting to the canopy, right? So perhaps what we could be seeing in 2016 was similar to that of 2015, where all of a sudden you have this spike. It could have been visibility by divers. They could have just all of a sudden started to see more 
fish out because there's no kelp to kind of block them and keep them out of sight. Um, but then you also have um, a situation where um, it kind of drops off, but then could stabilize. So again, this is the importance of long-term data collection so that we can look over a scale of time and see what the changes are, whether it's a sharp response or whether things are stabilizing. So stay tuned for 2020. It's incredibly variable, exactly. So rockfish in general, super, super variable, exactly. Um, so data summary, um, again, it wasn't just one thing that caused all of this. It was multiple, multiple conflicting sources that were really causing this phase change to happen. Um, we saw declines in the sunflower star, bull kelp, pteragophora, red algae, increase in purple urchin, um, fish, maybe stable, but let's, let's keep an eye on that one. Um, and I didn't mention this, but we were able to double the sites that we survey in the past couple years just to get a better resolution of what's happening up here. Um, so in discussion, um, I, I just want to start with that this, like all the other amazing speakers at this symposium, this isn't a simple fix, but it does start with us acknowledging what's going on and becoming educated on the processes that are happening here in our coastal waters. And we know, and I think as a biologist, what um, I did when I moved up here was just start with like, what do we know and what do we not know? And what we do know is that by hunting a top predator and by marine disease and a bunch of other environmental factors, we have the situation we're in now. Um, and I think, again, there are a lot of things we don't know, and the only thing that will start to answer some of those questions, especially here in the North Coast that is so understudied, is if we go out and impress that divers need to get in the water and continue to develop these long-term data collection records, but also do these sorts of public engagements so that folks can take it from there, right? Um, we need to know where to start to, to keep building. And I do want to end here as well is that this isn't just a local matter. So everything I just discussed in terms of phase state changes um, have been known to exist in all of these red dot areas. So I'm just going to name off the places right now that have endured a phase shift from kelp forest to urchin barren, which include the Aleutian Island Archipelago, Ala mainland Alaska, South and Central California, as well as North, Oregon, Washington, Norway, Japan, Tasmania, Australia, New Zealand, New South Wales, British Columbia, Nova Scotia, Gulf of St. Lawrence, Canary Island, Mediterranean, Chile, and South Africa. So with that, right, we're not alone in this matter. This isn't just us dealing with this. It's a bunch of folks dealing with this. So I think it's, I mean, it's very frightening to know that this is happening all over the world. But it's also encouraging to know that we can draw from these other places because they've experienced this perhaps two decades before we did. There's a lot we can learn and we don't have to reinvent the wheel when we're coming up with management strategies moving forward. So um, that's, I think that's a really uh, key piece. Um, and so let's take a breath for a sec, that was a lot. Um, but we're all here on planet Earth, we're trying to do something, right? And so whether we're here diving with Reef Check, um, with, with our divers, you're getting out and getting in the water, or you're going out and um, conducting urchin harvesting, you're on the beach measuring with the Noyo Center, you're, you're going and actually collecting the data that is being used for management, as well as the working group that is coming up with management strategies and all talking to come up with solutions. Or you're sitting here today and you just heard me talk about the kelp forest. Um, we're all here for a very similar reason, and that's to start understanding a system that we don't necessarily know much about, but we love so very dearly. And so I think I, I always like to end with like what you can do right now. Um, I see a lot of students around the room and uh, just a bunch of folks in general, but spend time outside. We are naturalists. We need to instill that being a naturalist is being a scientist, right? You need to get out and you need to experience the world. You need to see how things work. You need to sit outside and watch the birds move and see the trees change. I think, I, I can't impress how important that is and it was such an integral piece of my life growing up that I wouldn't have the same sort of um, mental clarity if I, if I hadn't spent that time outside. Um, talk about what you learned here today. Knowledge is power and stay vocal. 
um, beach surveys with Reef Check and Noyo Center. Um, we're, Sheila and I and um, Sarah at the Noyo Center are now coming up with a way that we can start empowering folks to do some beach surveys. So um, something we've been exploring is, so we go to these, go and do these subtitle monitoring efforts. And what happened last year is I went and did these surveys and then over winter, I'm like, the abalone moved in shallow, the storms are coming. And right after the storms, um, my partner Colin and I went on the beaches and we saw abalone washed up. And we realized no one was really counting those. And so um, I think it's really important now that we start surveying our beaches as well as the underwater environment to see some of the connectivity there. And what's great is that the Noyo Center is here in town and able to mobilize volunteers and do the trainings to get this rolling. So I think it's this beautiful intersection um, between a few different agencies. And I'm looking forward to that one. <laughs> um, and then lastly, if, if you're able and willing, I need divers. Um, again, I live here in Fort Bragg, but a lot of the folks that help me with these surveys come from out of town. And I don't think that's great. I think we should be doing this locally. We need to start thinking about our underwater backyard as a place we take responsibility for. Um, and with that, I'd like to give a very special thanks to all the divers that collected this data. Like, we know how, like, go put your foot in the water, like, after this. It's cold. <laughs> and they do that all summer. They, like, get completely naked in, in their suits by, like, 7 in the morning. So just, like, appreciate that. Um, and then also I had amazing intern helps. My partner Colin dives very often. Um, my dog is incredible. And the Kelper partnership is also great. Um, and with, oh, I forgot the graphic. How could I do that? Um, and with that, thank you. Yes. Okay, sorry I went a little long. <laughs> okay, good. Wow, fantastic. Uh, Sheila Siemens is here with us from Noyo, as well as Sue Coulter. Anybody else here from Noyo? Anyway, oh, hey. How you doing? I didn't see you back there. Um, and you know, that is a way to get involved. We'll have Sheila up here in about 20 minutes or so uh, with another, uh, some other local um, advocates and scientists talking. And uh, you can learn more about how you can get involved as a citizen science. And I want to just do a big shout out to the Noyo Center for Marine Science, all the energy that's been put into that the organization, the education, the intervention, the way you guys are bringing people together around these, these issues and making it local. So thanks so much for all your hard work. All right, we've got one more presentation before our panel. And that is from Howie Garrett again. He came all the way from Whitby Island. And we said, Howie, you gotta do at least two presentations because this man has been on the water and observing orcas for decades. And so I welcome you, and again, thanks for making that trip. All right, Howie. Yeah, sure, we get you. That's, uh, and mine is in the middle of that. Uh, and from. So yeah, let me find it. Yeah, keep going. Um, oh, I keep going, yeah. Keep going to that one. Yes. All right, and the clickers. Over there. The should be working. Okay, cool. Uh, so this is kind of a, a gift, a bonus for me, so thanks very much for letting me do this. Uh, but I just want to say this has been incredibly fascinating, eye-opening, and high impact in a lot of different ways. I, this is really quality work and, and, uh, and messaging too. Like Michael, I had no idea there were vast undersea industrial parks that were grumbling and rumbling all the time. And I thought your uh, just kind of offhand remark about that is a really key thing. Nobody's doing anything about it because nobody's thinking about it. That's what we're here for. That's what we're doing. And we're learning about the, the intertidal zones, the subtidal zones, every, you know, I mean, we're, we're learning about so much here. And that really is the key. I mean, that's our whole reason for being, is to, to spread that thinking, that education, that knowledge that is actionable, that people can do things about. So I think this has been hugely valuable. 
I will go as fast as I can because we got a lot to, uh, to deal with and we do have a deadline <laughs> imposed by PG&E. So uh, just moving along, this is sort of a, a general, and you know, I mean, this has been amazing and there is a lot of bouncing around from the micro to the mega to, you know, the ecological to the, the, the biosphere, uh, but it is all under ocean life. You know, I mean, so there's a theme here that is working, I think, it's great. Um, and this is gonna be not just orca-centric, it's gonna be southern resident-centric. I mean, that's, it's almost insignificant in comparison to everything that we're hearing today, it seems like, but they are magnificent to those of us who know them. So I am going to help to bring you into that world of people who know and love the southern residents, I hope. Um, and just to give you just, I mean, very briefly, where I'm coming from is our nonprofit on Whidbey Island. Uh, it has blossomed from, uh, actually it started in a previous iteration in 1995. Uh, and in the last five or six years, it's gone from really a mom and pop and a couple of kitties and a puppy dog into, you know, an actual organization. We've had to hire coordinators for our education department, our stranding department, um, and our Langley Whale Center, among other things. And that is uh, our walk-in storefront in Langley. If you're ever on Whidbey Island, please come to the Langley Whale Center. Uh, but probably our most you know, active, thriving uh, outreach has been the uh, sighting network in which we uh, accept sightings in every possible way, whether it's uh, email, phone call, Facebook, tweet, PM, every other kind of way that people send in sightings and photos and videos when they see whales around. And we relay that back so that more people will get the chance to get out there at the right time, at the right place, and see them as well. And that really brings out this community. It makes for this engagement of people sharing their, their experiences, their excitement, their joy. They've seen whales, they've learned a little more about them, they share that information. So there is this whole community of people, of I don't know how many thousands of people, we have like 159,000 people that read our Facebook and 15,000 that get our emails and you know various other parameters that indicate there's a whole lot of people paying attention to where the whales are, and we're sort of the clearinghouse, the watering hole for a lot of that information. And it changes people. It just, it makes people, uh, I, you know, I don't know, it improves people. And it makes them more actively engaged in doing something to help their beloved whales. Uh, but our cognitive origins, you could say, at least mine, and still to this day, what we really depend on most of all, of course, I mean, our tentacles and our, our sensors are out all the time uh, with every kind of new knowledge, every, every research, every, every new information we can get. But our sort of you know, basic principles of how you study whales and what has been learned about them comes from the Center for Whale Research. That's where I started, and, and uh, to this day, that's where really everybody gets their information, their demographic population parameters that tell us how many there are, when there are births and deaths, and when you know a lot of other information about uh, which pods are where at what times comes from the Center for Whale Research. And if you want to see some just beautiful, uh, write-ups and photos of encounters with whales go to whaleresearch.com and look for encounters and they're up to i think 85 encounters in 2019 and this archive goes back many years and each one of those is this this story the write-up the log essentially with all the essential information of who what where when by who, but it's personalized, it's in storytelling form, and the best photos and many great videos you're ever gonna see anywhere of orcas. It's just incredible. Uh, but of course, no talk about orca science can go by without giving due homage to the 
pioneer of the photo identification method, Mike Big, in Canada, who uh, kind of you know found it by uh, trial and error and uh, got a lot of grief for trying something that didn't involve uh, sticking something on them or, or you know, the, the only way that people knew to track wildlife populations was something that was highly intrusive, if not lethal. And he realized after a while he was seeing the same ones time after time, year after year, and that a good photo could identify each one. Uh, with the dorsal fin and the saddle patch pattern behind the dorsal fin, each one can be identified and recognized year after year, no matter where they show up or when. So that was uh, the key to the method, and of course that method is now being applied to every other kind of whale and virtually every other kind of wildlife around the world. So uh, he's a, a real pioneer that came up with something that works. So now to back up like an episode of This Is Us where we go back suddenly 50 million years. Um, this is, um, so, I mean, and this is so thumbnail, it's just a brief outline sketch, but cetacean ancestors were land mammals. You have to look at the evolutionary story. It is their story. Uh, the four-footed, uh, furry, probably, you know, grazing or some kind of foraging animal that uh, found some solace and protection and some food source in the sea. Uh, the closest land relative, I mean, current mammal relative is the hippopotamus, which is instructive because they're sort of amphibious, a lot of time in the water. So they just went further and further and further until after several million years, they could stay in the water and give birth in the water. And they adapted their entire physiology to be able to do that. And then roughly 12, 10 to 12 million years ago, uh, there was this sort of quantum leap in brain power in the dolphins, uh, these new species of dolphins that emerged. And among the very first and the largest and the largest brained of all of those was the orca. So they really came into being in pretty much their current size, shape, and form and, and uh, cognitive capacity um, roughly eight or 10 million years ago. There's not a very complete fossil record, of course. But in all that time, since then, they have been the top predator, the apex predator in the ocean. And that is sort of rattled off often as a factoid about orcas, but when you consider that they had nothing to fear, they had no fear in all that time. They, they had each other's back. They're really big and very uh, uh, capable of uh, defending themselves from anything. You just, you can't sneak up on an orca. Uh, so the only thing they had to worry about was each other. So that creates, uh, you know, some mental challenges. Uh, so you can sort of think of uh, 10 million years of orca history as them learning how to live together, how to share the planet. And they are the most uh, cosmopolitan of any of the whales they go to every uh, ocean habitat virtually, I mean, not up rivers usually, but uh, you know, warm water, cold water, deep water, shallow water, you'll find orcas. Uh, they tend to uh, conglomerate around the colder waters that are more productive, have more prey of all kinds, but uh, they can adapt to just about anywhere. Very sleek, very streamlined, very fast, very graceful, beautiful to watch. And here's where I could probably get in trouble with uh, some sort of, you know, con conventional or at least consensus uh, scientists is my estimation of such a very small global population. I mean, I, you know, people uh, assume a population based on a model, a sort of a carrying capacity model of their habitat and assume that probably 100,000, maybe 200,000. But when you look at the actual counts, and of course they're totally incomplete, but there are very preliminary counts in all over the world of 
orcas that are found and how they tend to live, which is in small communities. Small meaning several hundred, two, three, four hundred, sometimes more, probably, but uh, still, it just doesn't add up around the world to, as far as I can see, more than 20 uh, to 40,000 worldwide. Um, and of course, the most productive habitats are in the Antarctic. So that goes to something I'm getting to in a little while about agency, about sort of uh, conscious development and living. Um, and this is just, uh, this is kind of a factoid about their diving capacity. This is, does not represent their limits. I've heard of other diving records down to a thousand or more feet, but this was done by Cascadia Research uh, based on one time depth recorder suction cup tag that showed their diving pattern and they can now detect uh, hunts for salmon uh, and catches or failures to catch. They don't always catch their salmon, but uh, in the behavior patterns, they can tell a lot about what's going on down there. And for some reason, they stuck in a little graphic of a SeaWorld tank just for comparison, uh, which I think is kind of instructive. Um, there is a 17-month gestation period, a good long one, so they come out pretty well baked. Um, and I put in some, you know, sort of gratuitous, uh, you know, nice orca photos, calendar shots, you know, that just to make the slide look better. Um, but I found this to be an interesting observation uh, from this paper that dolphins in general exhibit self-awareness at a younger age than reported for children at that age, human children. So they're pretty acutely aware of themselves in terms of they're an individual within a family at a very young age. And this, uh, you know, is a way of trying to get at something that is still pretty mysterious, and that is this brain anatomy. There's been some recent work done that indicates that it's possible the brain of the killer whale may be the largest of all taxa, the largest brain of any animal on Earth, probably pretty much on a par with sperm whales. Uh, but sperm whales have previously always been considered to have the largest brains, and now it's, you know, they're pretty much even up. Um, so that's a lot of brain power. And especially when you consider it's about 4.8 times the size of our brains. So, you know, the challenge is for our puny little brains to try to figure out what's happening with those gigantic brains. And so we've got to, you know, do a lot of guesses and generalizations. And uh, so, you know, everything is kind of preliminary. But uh, reading up on this paper, right at all 2016, the corticalization of Orsinus orca may be exceeded only by the sperm whale, so again, pretty much on a par. And that's the process of transferring cognitive functions from the primitive areas of the brain to the cerebral cortex. In other words, learning, higher learning, understanding their, basically their bodily functions, what has been sort of uh, thought of as instinct, stimulus response, you know, those sort of reactions that the primitive brain makes us do when certain environmental factors happen, uh, they seem to have taken more under awareness into conscious control and choice. And that, you know, can be everything from breathing, their conscious breathing, everyone knows that, like every other marine mammal, they've got to very carefully time their breathing for when they're at the surface. Um, but also thermal regulation, uh, who knows, reproductive, uh, you know, patterns and behaviors. Um, so much of, of their lives are under their conscious control. And that huge brain is thought to by those experts that write these papers to have a lot to do with processing emotions and social cognition or empathy. 
that there is social awareness going on all the time. And yes, that is in their, in their brain hardware, believed to be, uh, but it's also a part of who they are. And I'm gonna get a little more into that to explain what I mean by there. Um, to negotiate interactions with conspecifics, don't we all wish we could do that a little better? So this seems to be a way of seeing a sort of a, you know, outward expression of what all that brain power is doing, what it looks like from the outside. And you can sum it up in the fact that they live in cultures. Tradition defined, determined, uh, based on learning, uh, transferring of knowledge and, and tradition, behaviors from one generation to another or just uh, amongst themselves. Um, and one example of that is that each community uses their own unique call repertoires. I have some work calls here, but uh, we're going fast, so I'm not going to play them necessarily. You probably all heard orca calls. They're very beautiful. But the point is that they are distinct, completely distinct and separate from one community to another, even when they're in the same habitat and cross paths virtually every day and have for thousands, tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, they maintain that integrity of their, their communication patterns. Um, and that started, to give you a little bit of sort of the history, uh, the early work was done by John Ford, who looked at uh, the acoustics of the northern residents and the southern residents, and a little bit, whenever possible, of the transient mammal-eating, or now big killer whales, uh, and found that to be the case. Within the communities, there are certain variations depending on the matriline or pod. Um, they associate for life with their mothers or their mother's family, and so that's a matriline. And matrilines together combine to form what we see as pods, J, K, and L pods, for instance. And those pods can have certain identifying signals in addition, above and beyond their shared vocabulary. But from the resident fish eating type communities to the transient mammal eating type communities that are all in the same waters, there is no overlap and no, no sharing of uh, call patterns. And another way of looking at this cultural development is, and really probably the basic way, is their dietary specializations. The fact that they do completely differentiate what they eat, what they'll go after. Uh, that the resident types eat not just only fish, but almost entirely only salmon, and not just any old salmon, but Chinook, as I went over this morning. Uh, they just depend on those Chinook salmon. And that's been a, you know, a very sustainable way of life for you know, who knows how many tens or hundreds of thousands of years in the North Pacific. Uh, but uh, now it's in big trouble, as I mentioned, because those Chinook are so decimated by so many degradations. Um, so that's sort of you know, a, a bit of the, the history of that. It, of course, was known and mentioned long before 1998, but as far as actually spelled out for science in detail, uh, this is really when it came out. And then in 2001, all of this was compiled together along with every other study of every other whale and dolphin around the world, which weren't all that many really uh, in terms of population studies of living whales, um, to look at their cultures. And what this paper in 2001 came up with in the abstract was that the cultures, behavioral, acoustic, 
cultures of these sympatric, same habitat, crossing paths, groups of Orsinus orca have no parallel outside humans. Their cultural development, their elaboration, sophistication, complexity, however you want to look at it, um, it just doesn't have any equivalent anywhere in wildlife biology except what you see in human cultures. That seems to be a product of that brain power, of that ability to define themselves, to determine their lives. Of course, they adhere completely to their cultures when they're alive, and yet they have that flexibility. They have the choice. Uh, for instance, in captivity, mammal-eating orcas very reluctantly and and uh, in at least one case, mortally, um, they can adapt to eating fish. It is possible. There's no biological you know, uh, enzyme inherited that requires that the fish eaters eat only fish and the mammal eaters only mammals. It is cultural tradition. It is what they were taught by their elders, by their mothers, essentially. And they just don't deviate if they can possibly uh, avoid it. And of course, there are some more whimsical applications of culture, like the occasional fad we see out there of fish wearing, of throwing a fish over their head and apparently seeing how long they can keep it there. I, I, it's a fad, you know, it's kind of like a playground fad. You wear feathers in your hat or something. And, I guess that's, you know, they're just doing that to show off. Um, but another indication, or maybe a, a manifestation, of their, uh, their, their cultural capacity and sophistication is uh, summed up here in this paper, uh, long known but written up here, uh, prolonged reprodu post-reproductive lifespan in killer whales, which really sums it up this way the longest menopause of any non-human species. Uh, orcas, at least the ones studied so far uh, on you know, long-term demographic studies, have shown their, their reproductive years go from roughly their mid-teens, sometimes early teens, sometimes later, but you know, roughly, give or take, mid-teens to about 40, again, give or take. I think the oldest known uh, birth the oldest female that has been known to give birth was 48, but it's rarely over 40. Um, but they can live decades longer than that. The females are certainly able, uh, and many do live until they're 60, 70, 80. J2 granny was estimated back in 1989 to be, uh, have been born in 1911. Uh, and just died a few years ago at uh, 106, I think it was. But that, you know, give or take, give or take a decade or maybe two. So maybe she was only 85, you know, but, uh, you know, many decades post-reproductive, very vigorous, very engaged life as a culture bearer. I mean, that's, that's the, the best theory for how those elder females are maintained, of course. You know, they're, they're all hungry mouths, you know, they're all eating the resource and they're all cared for, um, and they have roles. They have very important roles, and uh, that, you know, seems to have a lot to do. It certainly correlates with this cultural development that they are sort of the, the teachers, the standard bearers. Uh, from which the young learn how to live. Um, and what they do live in is this described as a bewildering array of exclusive, genetically distinct sympatric populations. Uh, some have called them xenophobic. Uh, certainly, uh, they practice avoidance even when they're in the same habitat. There's probably five at least different communities, types of orcas. They're, they're known as ecotypes. That's sort of the placeholder 
uh, as a name for the different types of orcas. But it doesn't necessarily derive from ecotypical conditions or environmental uh, stimuli or, or you know, factors. It is really, um, it's a, a culture. It's a culture that is, that grows out of, you know, ancient decisions made. Um, just as a little side note, the fish-eating resident types are believed to have come over from the Atlantic during the interglacial periods that there were several, all well over 100,000 years ago, um, and they were eating herring, mostly, although there were salmon, maybe they were eating salmon. There just aren't any more. But they came over into the Pacific and fanned out into different communities here, all depending on salmon, but they had to, you know, adapt to the Pacific rather than the Atlantic. So they can make those adaptations, um, but then, you know, they sort of uh, solidified into the communities and, and the lifestyles and behavior patterns that we see today. Um, and then there are these offshores out there. I haven't even gotten to them. They eat sharks and they are genetically, they seem to be a kind of a, a, a hybrid going back hundreds of thousands of years between the mammal eating and the fish eating types. And this is, uh, this is getting up on about 10 years old now, but it still remains the state of the art sort of graphic presentation of all these different types of orcas that are found around the world. And you can see a lot of variation. These are the resident types of which there are five different communities between here and Russia, the Kam uh, Kamchatka, Sea of Kamchatka. Um, so they're all kind of summed up as the resident types and they all have very similar diets, but there is no mixing in between them and their communications, their acoustics are completely different in each one. Uh, these are the mammal eating types, these are the offshores, these are the North Atlantic, and then this, the South Atlantic types, they get really kind of uh, wild and crazy in terms of different morphologies, different looks, coloration patterns, and sizes. Um, the, you know, a lot of them are very small. Some of them have this very snappy little cape, you know, from their dorsal fin to their eye patch, and some have huge eye patches, and some have little tiny eye patches. So, you know, certain morphological distinctions between them, but otherwise, uh, well, to this day, they're still considered to be the same animal, but there has been a movement afoot, and this is a very esteemed, uh, you know, collection of authorities, of, of geneticists and, and uh, demographers that have looked at all the different types of orcas around the world and have proposed multiple species, maybe five. And I'm not sure where that stands right now, if there is still any conversation, any resolution of how you divide those up into different species. Certainly fish eating and mammal eating seem like those are two separate species and that's why the mammal eaters have been bestowed with this name of Biggs killer whales uh, to sort of uh, name them already, but it's not really official, it's not really consensus, and you know, the problem is they don't fit the definition of speciation, of the development of species. There isn't a geographic separation or any, uh, you know, rule to follow for why there are certain types of orcas that pop up around the world. So it's really hard to delineate exactly where the species lie, which ones should be lumped into which species. Um, and just to bring it a little bit closer to home, between Baja, California, there are known to be uh, these four, and in addition the Kamchatka, Russia population, so five if you count them, uh, re uh, resident, fish-eating, almost entirely Chinook-eating populations. Uh, and then 
the West Coast transients, I think that's a little bit in flux because it has been considered that there are the California transients, there are the West Coast transients, there are the Alaska transients, and maybe the Bering Sea transients or the Western Alaska. But increasingly, they seem to uh, mix a little bit. You find, you know, just a few that uh, come up from California or that, you know, show up in Alaska or Western Alaska that, you know, started, were first seen somewhere else. So uh, the current thinking seems to be that they really are all one community uh, of 450 to maybe 500, and they are doing great. They are reproducing at about, well, it's been over 4% per year, uh, which is a pretty incredible growth rate. Um, and then there are these AT1 transients that uh, seem to be a completely separate and distinct population of transients that were ex essentially extirpated by the Exxon Valdez spill. Uh, they've lost their reproductive capacity entirely and they're down to seven. So they're not going to be around much longer. Uh, and there are the offshores, uh, about 350, and they're they're an odd duck out there. They're just a, a different type entirely. Uh, so the big killer whales, uh, one just interesting, and this is just a factoid, uh, that they, they communicate much less. They have a very uh, small set of known, what are called stereotypical calls, which are the calls that they repeat over and over. There may be some of what are called aberrant calls uh, beyond that that come up in certain situations, but the sort of identifiable, documented, stereotypical calls, they only have seven that they use uh, compared to the resident types, which have about 27 different types of calls. Um, and the mammal eaters, they sneak up on seals and sea lions and porpoises and often kind of triangulate and separate, come in from all angles and run silent, run deep, and they may even uh, put decoys out, pretend to leave, you know, on the surface, a dorsal fin will just take off into the distance a mile away, while the rest of the family is coming back underwater underneath to the unwary pinniped. So, uh, that's how that works. And this is uh, a good graphic illustration, not necessarily the last word because it's very hard to, to accumulate all the different data sources of sightings of whales in the Salish Sea. The Salish Sea, of course, is the inland waters uh, from you know, Georgia Strait, Puget Sound, everything in that inland sea. And it, this shows uh, well, these are the, the differences in years, but in the past three years, it's been fairly consistent uh, that what used to be almost always the resident types from May through September, that was virtually all we saw, and we saw them virtually every day back in the 80s, to now we don't see them much in the summer especially. Uh, a little bit in the fall because there's a chum run, that's their sort of second most favorite salmon, so they will come into the Puget Sound in the fall, uh, maybe 10 or 12 times, but uh, not so much around the San Juans. There's just not the salmon up there for them to eat, but there sure are a lot of seals and sea lions. So the transients have been everywhere always, I mean virtually year round. I mean it fluctuates a little bit, much more during the summer uh, and into the fall and, and uh, you know, into the beginning of the winter anyway, but they can be seen anytime, year round, and have been seen a lot. So their population is increasing, their occurrence, their sightings within the Salish Sea are increasing, their group size is increasing. Uh, it was once documented that they were always in groups of three or four, maybe five tops. Now we see superpods, we call them, of 
The transient matural lines, they're in matural lines as well, with the elder female being sort of, you know, at the, the peak of their family and all their generations arrayed around them. Uh, but, you know, they, when they're stalking prey, when they're in hunting mode, they have to spread out. The offspring, some of them have to leave. Uh, so they tend to be, when they're strictly hunting, in still fairly small groups, larger than before, more like seven or eight or ten sometimes, but then they'll get together. And there have been as many as 50 seen at one time. This is when they're in a celebratory mood, when they're all well fed and they're popping up out of the water all over the place and having a really good time. Then they run silent, run deep, and go out and get dinner. Um, and the northern residents uh, has grown too. They seem to have a pretty good supply up there. It may be on a plateau at this point, but since 2002, they've grown at about 2.2%. So that in 2018, there were 302 individuals in 16 pods and three acoustic clans, which are within the community. There are, uh, in the northern residents, there are different, not completely different, but at least, you know, sort of distinct uh, vocabularies, you know, sets of calls that you can find. Uh, so they're doing pretty well. And they're on the north end of Vancouver Island and up into southeast Alaska. And then the offshores. I've gone over them already pretty much. Uh, more recently discovered in the early 1990s. Um, so southern resident orcas, and I'll kind of spin through this because uh, we don't have a lot of time. Um, male and female offspring stay with their lives. This is uh, what I consider, whoops, to be, um, well, anyway, this is southern resident orca habitat. This is 90% of it. This is their core range, but that's not what this map was for. This was designed to define this new concept of the Salish Sea, you know, all the way from Puget Sound down here to Georgia Strait up here, the San Juan Islands, Whidbey Island here, Everything in between had five or six different names. So it got very difficult to explain where the whales were when they go everywhere in that. So not just the whales, but in general, that is one ecosystem. That is one sort of overall habitat, especially, I love this map because for a couple of things, but one is the way it defines not just the sea, but the watershed. This is everything that flows into the sea. So that's what we have to pay attention to. But another reason that I especially love and the reason that it is the southern resident core habitat is because it shows the mouth of the Columbia River down here. And I think that's an accident. It was just so they could have this legend and this inset map so they needed a little more space down below. So they extended the map that happens to include the mouth of the Columbia, which is where the southern residents go most of the year, certainly the winter months, to find food. From the salmon that are returning from their migrations two, three, four years in the North Pacific back to the Columbia to go into the Columbia Basin, up all the tributaries, including the Snake River, which I talked about earlier. Um, so yeah, just a few sort of factoid parameters. Southern residents average 22 and a half males. 22 and a half, we used to think that they were much bigger than that until somebody measured. And it turns out they're not as big as we thought they were. And the newborns are seven or eight feet long after, as I mentioned, 17 months gestation, give or take. Um, and just to reiterate, because it is such a key point, that, and this is from no less than John Ford, uh, the sort of founder of a whole lot of the acoustic and dietary science of resident orcas in particular, that they are creatures of tradition. They learn what constitutes food. So you can imagine a you know, mammal-eating transient coming up on a salmon and sticking their nose up. You know, ooh, yuck, who would touch that? You know, I mean, it's, it's what those particular animals that are in both their habitats mean to them, how they respond to them. 
And for a resident, the Chinook is the object of attraction that they will go for and consume. Um, and they don't care about pinnipeds or porpoise. They'll just sort of go around them. Usually, they may play with a porpoise. I mean, there are interactions, but they don't eat them. And so they're, they have a completely different attitude toward different animals in their environment. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that orcas worship fish, or I'm not saying we should, but is it wrong? <laughs> I just like that cartoon, a Ray Troll cartoon. I think it's very well done. Uh, and breezing through, and this is conjecture. This is sort of scuttlebutt that I picked up. It's not documented. I can't prove it. Nobody can prove I'm wrong. But they are different. Southern residents, relative to the other, even salmon-eating resident communities around Alaska, the herring eaters of the Atlantic, and all the fish eaters in the Antarctic, they're different. They're, in many ways, they're more active, they're more social, they're more playful, they're more curious, they seem to want to know who's on board, you know, and what are you doing here? Or just when there's no boat around, they just kind of, you know, like to look around, and they're not looking for seals or sea lions, they're just sort of checking out their surroundings. Um, and of course, they have the open saddle patches, that's one, you know, distinction, but it's not perfect because they don't all have open saddle patches, but uh, they, they're the ones who do, is the, the residents. Of course, that applies to the other residents in uh, northern British Columbia and Alaska as well. And they almost always hunt salmon, um, but often and increasingly in the last five or so years, uh, spread out, working harder. Uh, I have seen them, you can't get a photo of this unless you're way up high, 10 miles apart from the leaders to the trailers in the same pod. And of course, they can communicate over that distance. They probably have to yell. But it's like being sort of in the same big room. The ocean is not as big a place for a whale of any kind as it is for us. Uh, so they, you know, they are spread out in relation to how they like to travel or how they tend to travel when they are well fed, which is right tight together. Oops, well, that's the one that won't show. Oh, no. Well, there seems to be uh, a glitch in the system here. Maybe that'll do it. How am I doing for time, anyway? We're over. Way over. All right. Um, well, let's just end it here. No, I understand. I totally understand. We are way over, and we do have this imposed deadline. So I'll leave it at that. The movie later. Howie. Howie has spoken everywhere. I mean, he's the one that if you're at a conference, you know, you go see Howie. Anyway, we're going to have a panel. It's going to last a little bit shorter because we do have a dead, uh, deadline with PG&E and so on, but can we have the chairs put out? Sheila, come on up. We've got Sheila Siemens from Noyo Center, Sue Coulter, Sarah Bogard, Jeff, you out there still? Um, Tree, you're going to come on up and be on that. Tristan and Bob. Bob, you're up on this panel. And this will be a conversation with our local advocates, ocean specialists. Um, I may introduce you guys briefly just to kind of give everybody an idea of who is here and what they've done and, and why they're here. Thank you for sticking with us. We're a little bit over time, but I, I'm kind of spellbound bound by all the information. I'm really enjoying it. Howie, again, I want to thank you. It was brilliant. So um, we have Sarah Bogart right here, who has been doing seal counts, has a lot of information for us. We have Tree Mercer, who with her partner and spouse, Scott, started the Mendonoma Whale Research. We have Tristan, who we heard from, of course. Um, who's doing the reef check, reef check, right? Sheila, your director of the Noyo Center for Marine Science, Jeff Jacobson, we saw him on the panel earlier um, this morning, who is an orca specialist among many other things. We've got Bob Spees 
oceanographer, marine biologist who uh, worked on the Valdez oil spill cleanup. Lots of information there for us about toxins and what happened up there. And then, of course, we've got Sue Coulter, our education person. Many of you know Sue, Sue Magoo, um, who works for Noyo Center for Marine Science, as well as mentored my daughter since she was five years old on ocean science. Thank you for doing that, because we know what she's doing now. Appreciate your time. So we're going to start with Sheila uh, doing some talking about Noyo Center for Marine Science. Give us, you know, like a five, ten minute or whatever, you know, something about what are you guys doing there? And then we'll just go down the line and, and get a discussion going with everybody who's out here in the audience. a dearth of scientific knowledge about our area of coastline. So uh, when uh, the community was trying to decide what to do with the mill site, they decided one of the things they really wanted in this community was a marine science center. So we're starting that, and we say Noyo is now, even before we have our facility. So if you haven't seen the 12 acres that we have secured on the Fort Bragg headlands for our future home, um, it's right by our crow's nest interpretive center, so you can go see that sometime. We just put in a 73-foot blue whale dirt mound to give an idea of what our blue whale looks like. Um, but we also opened a discovery center in downtown Fort Bragg to um, continue to provide more opportunities for the public to learn about what's going on. And one of the biggest things Tristan has already talked a lot about is partners together were trying to address this kelp forest crisis that we, that we are um, having off our coast. Um, we see as we move forward in climate, in a changing climate in, a, in, a, in an unknown future, um, large stressors uh, coming together and compounding problems and shift, making these shifts happen really quickly. And so one of the things that I want to um, impress upon you today is that it is never more important time to have science working for us right now and we have an odd discussion about what fact is going on in our national um, uh, platforms but you know science is science so it's never more important that we have our science um, as we continue to look at how we can address these big things as they happen. For instance, the marine heat wave that Tristan talked about. If you were reading the papers in September, they're starting to say, oh, we have another heat wave forming. Um, what did we learn from the first ones? And what do we, how do we know how to change the way we do things differently for the next one? And that's really the key of what we need to be doing right now. So, you know, we have an incredible, we have two, well, I think we have two really great things working in our favor. Humans are, are creative and they have the ability to innovate when they're given the proper motivation, right? I think we have the proper motivation now, but <laughs> it's amazing to me it's taken this long. But anyway, we, we can innovate and we can make changes that can, re that can really reduce a lot of the impacts we're talking about today, right? Um, and the oceans, the second thing is the oceans are really resilient, right? So given half a chance, the oceans can, can, can help us help them, right? So, if we look at the four things that we really need to be kind of um, using in our toolbox as we move forward in an uncertain future, science is kind of at the top, right? We need to know what kind of changes we're having, what kind of scales we're looking at, what kind of compounding issues are coming together. Technology, I mean, technology now, I mean, our phones can, can um, they can become research grade microscopes, right? So, so the kind of changes that we need to make in order to address these large shifts that happen quickly um, are being, we are being able to address that with some really amazing technological innovations. And the, and the way that we can integrate our, all of our data from the ORCA network to the harmful algal bloom network to, you know, all these networks that we now have coming together to look at the larger scale and the smaller scale versions of what we're talking about. That's all because we have incredible technology now. Management, I mean, our management agencies aren't really able to be super 
Um, they're not really known to be super dynamic and flexible, right? But we're going to have to have management changes happen on a quicker basis if we're going to get ahead of some of the problems that we saw from this last marine heat wave and some of the issues that we're dealing with on, on the fishery side. Um, we're going to need to make changes quickly. Like when you saw that spike in, in Tristan's um, graph of, of abalone, we really should have seen that we saw all those those subtitle abalone that were coming in shore to get food, that was the security net for the, for the fishery. That was, the, that was what they kept at the, outside the range of free divers as sort of the stock for the, for the fishery. So we, we ended up delaying another year, year and a half after we saw that pulse. We need to be quicker to, to, to make changes to our fisheries, for instance. Um, and the last one is community. Like we need a community to get engaged and get involved. I mean, how do we relate to, to climate issues that we face here in Mendocino County? We have, we have forest fires that we're dealing with and they are in your face and they, you feel them and you see them and you know the impacts to those. But we have an equally big issue going on in our underwater forests and it's hard to see and you take a nice walk on a beautiful day and you can forget. So we have to figure out how we can engage in these issues in a meaningful way to make changes. And so in our community, for instance, where we're, you know, with $44 million fishery, abalone fishery was closed and um, one of our more lucrative, uh, the, the red urchin, commercial red urchin fishery um, has, is pretty much closed. So we have some real economic inputs, I mean, economic hits to this community. So how can we as a community continue to support what we, what we value as our way of life, our community values, um, and engage in these issues? So we're trying really hard to create a market for the purple urchin so we can incentivize the take of those and we can create a restorative seafood product that when you eat that, you know you're actually helping uh, you're helping the environment by reducing an overpopulated species. So there's a lot going on. Sorry, that was probably more than five minutes. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> that's happy, good. Happy to, happy, to, <laughs> happy to talk about it. But, but just as a, as a last um, kind of addendum to the start of what I said, was that we saw that, those, that, that wave of Nubus articles about the new blob that was coming in around September. I had a couple slides to show you what they look like in Octo early October, what they look like now. So because that particular event isn't as deep as Tristan was talking about, you know, we have the horizontal mixing. The original blob in 2014, 2015 went hundreds of meters deep. It was stable, it was here for a while. This one we just saw was 35 meters deep and it's already dissipated slightly. That doesn't mean it's not gonna come back. So those are the kind of, we now have a tracking system for heat waves. Those are the kind of innovations that we need to, 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 to follow through with so we can make sure we can be more adaptive. That's what adaptive management really needs to become. All right, so um, you're out there. You may have questions here for our audience. Uh, I'd also like to invite any of you sitting here on the panel to talk about how can we take action here locally? What can we do with everything we've heard today, everything we've learned, what we know what's going on right out here? Um, what are some of the actions we can take as individuals and as a community to help out? Well, I can start with that um, and hand it down the road, but one of the good examples of what people can do is we have a citizen science program for this urchin project. So we pay our commercial divers as a partnership, I say we, um, to go in and collect urchin, reduce the population so we can hopefully get um, some of those spores that Tristan was talking about to settle and, and expand our current kelp beds and build a little more habitat and build a little more seed bank. Um, we have a team of about 25 maybe citizen scientists that go down and meet every one of those boats that come into shore at the docks and they take data. We, we can now say that in 2018 we brought in uh, one point, almost 1.3 million urchins through that program, um, 166 wow. diver days. Uh, we can give you statistics on size. We can tell you what they look like. They're starving, but they're still reproducing. There's a lot that we can tell because people went down. People gave their time to go down and met, meet those boats. They met the fishermen, and they and they get engaged in the in a really meaningful way in the program. And same with you know Tristan's group or the beach surveys. You know we do these beach surveys 
because we need to respond to marine mammals. We've been doing this for a while. And Tristan and I started talking, and we're like, why are we not bringing together more issues? Why are we not looking at the invertebrates that are coming up to shore and, and correlating that with the subtitle surveys that, that Tristan's doing? So we, well, I think you can get involved in a lot of really specific ways um, with pretty much any of our organizations up here. Anyone else? Can anybody else want to answer that? Sue, why don't you talk about something there, what you've been doing with youth, it's a big deal. Well, because our youth, Greta Thunberg <laughs> is our rock star out there, isn't she? Interesting. we know how powerful the youth can be. With the beach response, I, I teach at Montessori Del Mar School, doing an after school program and I help in the classroom there and did beach cleanups with them monthly a couple years ago and we just started doing it again with the paperwork, which makes it a little more official it's a little disappointing to them because we go for trash pickup and there wasn't as much trash this time, but we got to count the kelp that we saw and things like that. So um, uh, my thing is to just uh, excite the kids about what's out there in that ocean. I try to wow them with what I find amazing about the ocean because um, to grow up at, at a young age to be surrounded by all this heavy news about what's going on with the planet to me is, is um, heartbreaking as a grown up. So I try to keep my enthusiasm and my excitement about that. We've been going to the schools for five years now. We go into first grade and fifth grade classes with age appropriate interactive um, education. And so we saw fifth graders last year that we knew as first graders. And so we're building a connection with these children. And then we developed a program with the second graders around the ORCA. And so it's, they're getting information that then I'm hoping they bring home and have a conversation about. Um, and so they're developing awareness around the neighbors out there in the ocean. And then we go into the middle school, we go to the high school, and we have a marine science and art fair. Um, and so there's lots of different ways we engage the youth. Sarah works with interns from the high school. And so we're just trying to keep the spark alive around learning more. And I have to say in the time that I've been doing this, I have more young women coming up to me and saying that they want to go into marine science. And I'm not against boys being into science, but that makes me really excited. And I um, was at the downtown a couple weeks ago when a young woman came through and I gave her such a, a, a cheering on that she left like five feet off the ground because she didn't feel that way about it because she, like me, was an East Coaster. And in the East Coast, the idea is you got to get a career. And it has to be a big money paying career. And science isn't a big money paying career. So like, just giving that support and enthusiasm to learn and discover and um, kind of expand our awareness around the ocean. So that's part of what I like to do. That's why you see me wearing orca socks. <laughs> I'd just like to say, based on my experience in uh, Gulf of Alaska uh, for about 13 years, uh, I, I was living in California, but kind of commuting back and forth um, as a chief scientist for the two governments on the Exxon Valdez spill. We were spending about $100 million a year on research, and we had multiple large ecosystem studies uh, in progress, um, particularly from about 94 on, when a lot of the species were not recovering as we expected them to. Um, and we found, uh, we were able to, f we, we had some leaders with a lot of vision, and they bought into the idea, we just don't need to study the separate species we need. We need these large interconnected and interdisciplinary uh, studies that were going all the way from oceanography all the way up to the, the, the top predators and looking at cycles of production and long-term cycles from uh, records that could be uh, retrieved and so forth. And those were very, very successful. Um, I think it would be absolutely fantastic to have something like that on the North Coast. Uh, one of our problems, I think, is that we don't have a, a research university that's dedicated to that sort of thing around here. And I think we're very grateful to have what we have. We have the Noyo Center, I think, and, and they're doing a great job. Uh, I, I see, uh, you know, I don't want to turn this political, but I see the, uh, where we have to go here if we're going to make a, a big difference. We can work around the edges with the global warming problem. We can tr try to carpool, cut down on airplane flights, all kinds of things we can do. Uh, and that kind of dimples around the edges on a, on a small scale. But I think being politically active and supporting candidates on a national level that um, 
uh, are really after this problem and they just don't deny it is, is the way forward and that's not an easy thing to do. California is going to be blue, but there are other states that may swing one way or the other, and maybe we need to put our efforts there. So, thank you, Bob. Just, yeah. Bob Spees, local, local on the Mendo Coast. Thank you. Jeff, uh, you hear the word citizen science, and I, I've just been reminiscing on on that. Is that that's a kind of fairly new term um, to call our tribal awareness of what's going on around here. And it's just, you can go out and you can figure stuff out with your friends around here. And, and we've got catalysts that organize it, like Noyo Center, et cetera. But yeah, kill your television. You know, the global news, all that stuff that you're used to just go, God, the same old human stuff again. We're very anthropocentric. We love our mirrors. And fear is the biggest selling point, period, you know? The armed forces are keeping our fear safe for us, but we're, our fear is also providing the impetus for that. And it's valid. Go back to our tribal histories. We fought each other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what I want to get back to is that we've got little tribes throughout this whole community that are out looking at seabirds and looking at what's going on in the forest and whatnot. And we can network now like we never could do it before with our gizmos and our um, electronic networking abilities. And so all the time you spend filling your mind and your preoccupations with um, the national global world stories, well, why don't you substitute some of that for what's going on local and learn from one another. And, and you've already seen how terrifically fertile that can be and local, you know? The think globally, act locally, is, is that how that one worked? And one other perspective is that on an energetics level, getting back to the oil thing, um, a terrestrial animal to transport itself a mile, say, on level ground, we pay, it costs us 10 times the energy that it takes for a bird, a fish, or a whale to, to move that same difference, 10 times except when we're in our cars. This helps you on an energetic level perhaps understand how much we're so in love with our gas pedals. Because we're almost in a resting state. People fall asleep driving, right? And yet we're going 60 miles an hour all day long. However, it's a closed system, this planet. We all ultimately pay the full cost. And we're, we're able to do that 60 miles an hour because we're borrowing from the past of all that energy stored from da 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 So there's a large scale perspective. Continuation of question? All right. Um, so something I, I feel very, very strongly about personal action, personal accountability. That you know, at face value, like we, we can do what we want, um, we can say what we want, but we can't control other people. The only person you can control is yourself. And so I think face value, um, you know, I was just in the grocery store at lunch and you have a choice, right? Every single time you go to the grocery store, you have a choice. You can buy something packaged or you can buy it without any wrappings on it. That is your choice. So just remember that that is very valuable. Just think of all of us, went to the grocery store right now, and we all shopped in the bulk bin. What would the garbage look like in all of our trash cans then? Like those little micro adjustments, not even, like just personally for yourself, but radiating for your family. Like I come from an Ar Armenian descent family who's like not in touch with it because they, they immigrated from all over the place and they don't have a strong tie to the land because of a genocide. So th there wasn't that strong impressing sort of vibe that I got as a child, but um, again, moving forward, that's something that, you know, when I noticed that my family was just creating so much trash, you know, I was like the hippie showing up with like the bag of <laughs> bulk bin stuff, but over time, over time it's become hip, right? So let's, let's make it hip, let's impress that like those micro adjustments actually add up like quite largely. Okay. 
Um, I'm Teresa Mercer, and in, since 2014, my husband Scott and I do a gray whale census along this coast. We primarily count the gray whales on their migration, both south as well as north. Um, we um, count these whales mainly from the Point Arena Peninsula, but we have other observation sites where we collect data and we share it with other organizations. And um, it's, it's been a privilege and an honor to be able to do this. Uh, so we have now six years of data. And I think this year uh, coming up will be extremely important and very telling in light of the um, UME, the unusual mortality event that has been declared. So we're anxious and we're nervous and we're really looking forward to seeing what we see and how many whales we do see. Of course, in doing this, we're looking at all other marine mammals we see there as well. We've had uh, feeding blue whales, four feeding blue whales not too far off the coast one day, four blue whales here, seven finbacks feeding over here, breaching humpbacks offshore, and juvenile gray whales right beneath us, a day like a no other. Uh, that they stayed around for two days eating the krill. We learned that the krill was very dense, but then now they have moved off. But we're out there looking every day. We spend four to seven hours a day when the weather and the ocean conditions allow us to be out there. In terms of what you can do, you can report sightings to us. There's a, we have information out there. We'd love to hear from you. We do come up and observe from the Mendocino headlands from time to time. I agree with Bob very much that, and I don't want to turn it political either, but you must keep pressure on your elected officials. Show up when Jared Huffman's going to be there. Get, give him your support in breaching those dams to save the orcas. Uh, let's see what's going on with the grays and, and, and any other marine mammal that needs our help. Thank you. And the gray whale mortality is up to over 1,200 now, we're thinking? 200, 212 that have been counted strand, stranded that we actually have seen. But as Scott said earlier, that might uh, only represent 10% of the whales who have died because most, most of the whales will have sunk and we never see them. So that could mean a potential loss of 2,100 whales. Yes, their population is healthy but it's a red flag.